Good afternoon. My name is Kirk Shannon Butts. I am the Public Art and Creation Manager for the Baltimore Office of Promotion in the Arts, BOPA. Today I'm here with our artist, Sanzi Kermes. Yes. And I would like to first start by saying and acknowledging our sponsors this year for the 32nd Annual Open Studio Tours, Maryland State Arts Council, MSEC, and also Rika Vavka. So let's get right into the art. Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so you have quite the eclectic studio here. So why don't you tell me first a little bit about you and then how you got to this location. Right, so I've been um, working here in Baltimore as a professional artist, um, really dedicated myself to it probably back in like the late 90s. Mm -hmm. And I was searching for a studio space where I didn't have to have a landlord. I wanted to make sure that I could um, control my heat and air conditioning. <laughs> it's very important for me to have climate control. Yeah. And I was driving through here. There was a business down the street who used to develop slides. And I drove down the street and saw this property for sale. And it was a steal by Baltimore standards even then. How long ago was that? Um, 1998. Um, so it's been in process ever since then, and I just keep adding to it, and, and um, I think I've just told you how I finally finished my wall over here. So You'll see that in a second. She needs to have this really amazing um, mosaic mugs wall. And yeah. so um, one of the wonderful things about being a curator is that you get to um, get an insight into the artist. And I remember... Um, when we first had a real conversation, you were telling me about your background and you did cartography, if I was, I'm correct? Yes. I was cartography a... people, maps. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I did not get a, an undergraduate degree in art. I went to Syracuse University and got my bachelor's in geography and also advertising, thinking that I was gonna become like this person who made travel brochures <laughs> so I could like design and, and to, do art. And pretty soon after I'd graduated and I got my first job in the advertising industry, I was like, these are not my people. <laughs> so I left that, got a job as a cartographer and did that for quite a number of years, um, still kind of miserable. So I was right. poor and miserable and I thought if I was gonna be poor, I might as well be poor and happy. Right. Um, left the corporate world and started a full-time art practice. Wow. So how did you get to Baltimore? Well, I grew up in Carroll County mm -hmm. and um, went to school in upstate New York. And then when I came back, I'd gotten a couple of jobs around the Baltimore area um, and found my first apartment up on Cold Spring Lane. And I've always lived within the same, like, probably two-mile perimeter right. since that first apartment. Right. So Sanzi is one of those good people in the art community that helps a city vitalize because this is, community is Remington, which is now known as a key art community. However, in 1998, it probably was not. Oh, no, there was nothing. <laughs> no. Um, but it was great. All the neighbors in, in this, they just have been lovely. Right. And they all look like what's going on in there right. um, and sometimes they'll actually ask but it's a very steady and start this used to be called little little Italy <laughs> because there were a lot of Italian stonemasons who lived right. here and if you look at the front of my building right. you'll see different styles of form stone on the bottom half and the top half right. so obviously one of the people who had lived here was a stonemason wow. and was experimenting with the types of form stone that he right. could produce wow. so um, another interesting thing about Sanzi, again, as a curator that you learned is that um, your art is based in also Japanese practice and haikus, but there's an, it's it? another name. What's it's called, the word? It's a senryu. Tell the audience. <laughs> senryu, S-E-N-R-Y-U. And the only difference between a haiku and a senryu is that a senryu is non-nature based whereas haiku is supposed to be only about nature. And if you um, study anyone who writes haiku, they're very they're purists. Right. They want you to really stick to the form as well as the fact that it's nature-based. And I cannot make that claim with what I write. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, now let's get into the art. Okay. So um, also before we start moving about, and Sanzi takes us on a tour, a proper tour of her studio, and maybe do a demo, I hope you will. Um, 
my very first show here in Baltimore, I think that's where we met. So I was working with the artist named Stephen Towns, who is now kind of very popular now in Baltimore, but it was his very first show and it was a really small gallery. In fact, it was a restaurant. Yes, in, uh, it was National North Arts Cafe. Right. Yeah. And um, with Kevin Brown. And so Sanji was there with a friend and I was standing behind you and I had just met Stephen maybe three weeks ago and I was helping him promote the show and, and um, he was new and reluctant. And so you were in front of me admiring one of his works and you said, oh my God, he's a really good painter. Yes. And for me, um, that meant so much because I was still learning him and I thought, I knew he was good. Yes. But who else knew he was good? But coming from you, and I was like, okay, good. <laughs> and I'm thing. really pleased to say that I have a small painting of his upstairs. I know, because I was it's trying like to buy the same one. <laughs> <laughs> Remember? <laughs> right. So we were kind of after the same piece of yeah, art. Yeah. And then, um, so he had, I want to say nine pieces, 11 pieces in that show and nine sold that night within like three hours or something crazy. So also that solidified like, yeah, yeah. Like something was special. So with that, I later got to work with you yes. on a, a show that you were doing where some of these amazing dresses that we're about to go into um, came from. And um, we've really been friends pretty yeah, much ever yeah, since that night. Really, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. And then of course you were um, stint at City Hall. Oh, right. Where and you showed this. I did show, I showed this. <laughs> and, um, and Liz Faust was the curator for that. Right, yes. and Liz is joining us tonight for a um, chat, or tomorrow night, Liz. So, yeah. and, and she's at the Catalyst now, which is a, another hot gallery. It is, right. yeah. Right. And Liz and I have a project that we've pitched mm -hmm. to GLB, which is um, a memorial fund out of DC. Oh, wow. We're still waiting to hear about that. You'll get that. We'll, we'll but Liz is getting your work. So great. I'll give everyone kind of a background to the work that I do. Um, as Kurt pointed out, I was a cartographer in my previous life, and I think that that has informed the um, pattern making that you'll see. But what had happened is that, um, you know, my life took a lot of twists and turns, and I was in the UK with a newborn baby, and I was kind of going, what will I do? I would like to do something. And I knew that if I... I worked on my master's while I was in the UK, which I'm very proud of because the um, the perspective of um, a European point of view Absolutely. is very different. I made an offhand comment to um, one of the instructors there that I've always been fascinated by Scrabble and the patterns. And um, so I started documenting the games and I started documenting also the words that are played. And Scrabble is a very unique linguistic experience. In Scrabble, there are words that we will never say in our everyday language. We're not gonna walk around and go, uh-uh, because uh-uh, which you play in Scrabble, which is AA, is um, a form of lava in Hawaii. So unless we live <laughs> in Hawaii, it's not in our everyday lexicon. Right. And then there are other words. And it's also fascinating because it's a cross-cultural um, experience. So I was playing with someone who was from the UK, and I'm from. So he was using the Oxford Dictionary. I'm using the Webster's Dictionary, and he would play a word, and I'd be like, "What word is that?" And the best example I can give of that is the word "stoved." Now it is in the American language, but it's antiquated. We right. don't use it. Whereas in the UK, they would know right away "stoved," and it means to hit somebody on the side of the head with a blunt object. So I wanted to keep the words alive as well as um, look at these different patterns that develop as a result. So I started um, screen printing those and um, started out on paper and then um, six years ago um, Center Stage was doing a big renovation and I thought well, it'd be great to print onto some costumes and they were taking away, um, you know, there was a big tag sale. So I went to the tag sale, bought a bunch of things at and center stage. At center backstage. stage. Yes. All these costumes, which leads into a whole nother realm that, and this is the other thing I love about my job. I get to keep learning about different processes and different uh, professions. So I got these costumes and some of them were in pretty bad shape and I started um, fixing those up. And then I um, was awarded a, a solo exhibition at Creative York in Pennsylvania in what they call their project space. And a project space is you get an idea and you start to experiment with that idea. And that at the time I decided was that I was going to keep printing on these um, costumes 
And then something happened. Um, someone gave me a wedding dress. And then I found a wedding dress for like 15 bucks. And I started thinking about brides. And I called that show Brides Revisited. Because, and, and this is where now I'm launching into the next piece of this, where I'm looking at these wedding dresses. Um, the word is getting out. Other women are giving me their mother's wedding dresses. Um, their, and their stories with those. And it's really fascinating from a social aspect to see what role a wedding dress plays in a woman's life. Absolutely. And when does that begin? You know, and some of these, one of my best lines is out of the TV show Friends, where Ross is being an idiot, like his usual character self, and his sister says, Ross, how long have you been thinking about this wedding? And he goes, I don't know, a month? <laughs> and, and, and his sister turns and says, well, I can guarantee you that Emily's been thinking about it since she was five years old and she put a pillowcase on her head and pretended it was a veil, right? Well, that's what women do right. as young girls. Okay, and so we have this whole social um, uh, lexicon over what a dress means to us, what our style means to us, and what we take to that um, event. So with that, I... Well, before you get there, that's why it's, uh, the relationship with curator is so important because we go into all that. Because for me, obviously, the, the initial thing is this graphic. You can see it here. Mm -hmm. She. Um, Sonzi did this and all of this and she's going to walk you through here but for me when I saw this I thought wow that's special that's interesting and then you learn more about it so I'm going to step off or out and I'm going to let you walk us around and um, have okay, a spotlight thank you. okay all right so and don't forget about this <laughs> yes, right. sit back now. <laughs> so we have a lovely piece over here that found people will show that was it was an award-winning piece yes this piece and i believe that i'm great i'm showing it to you now via the camera so this is a dress and this is a dress that i got for 15 dollars at a um, an antique store in pennsylvania um and in fact it was on one of my trips out of seeing the creative space i had a year probably 14 months to prepare for that exhibition. And I got this dress. It took me months to repair this dress. It had ink spots, lipstick stains, mud. Um, and so I've learned a lot about fabrics, but then I printed on it and the, the dress is hooked up. So it looks like very poofy, but the train is probably about um, six or seven feet um, printed on this. And it was accepted this past year at the Maryland Biennial and received an honorable mention. So I'm quite proud of that. Congratulations. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right, and then the other thing I want to show you, as I said, so in this iteration, I'm in the process of collecting more dresses. So the thought being that um, we want to, and I say we, hopefully in, in with me and Liz Faust, that we'll be able to um, develop a series of events and storytelling time but also kind of a fashion event where I'm going to reconfigure some of these dresses. Um, certainly they still all um, need to be refurbished to some level and some of them changed because one of the things that I'm aware of is that I don't particularly like some of the fashions um, and I'm giving myself permission to change the dresses around. But um, uh, this one I want to point out is if everybody remembers our Kate Middleton from when, um, not Kate Middleton, her yes. sister Pippa, Pippa, when Pippa was walking up that long space with the buttons going up her back. This is that knockoff, the affordable one. But this dress is also in um, some disrepair and there are markings down at the bottom, which is very typical. You know, you've got a dress like this and a woman's walking around and having a good time. And sometimes you'll get stains on the front of the dresses and it does take a lot of work. So that is that aspect of that. So is that called the Pippa dress? This will be called the Pippa dress. Yeah. Okay. And I, the way that I got some of these dresses, I just got 15 dresses because I have a friend who um, has been a longtime volunteer at the Wise Penny here in Baltimore, which is a secondhand place. And they allowed me to go into the basement and look at all of the dresses. So I had like an hour to sift through these wonderful dresses and upstairs we'll show you how I have a stack of six boxes. And also I've gotten some of my dresses um, from neighbors and, um, and from other artists 
So there's a lot of really exciting stuff here and a lot of stories to tell. And I find that piece really compelling. So follow me, we'll go up the steps. So I do my work in stages. Um, when I see these dresses and I know that they need to have some work done to them, I start off here, this is like the bath, so to speak, and I've got all my materials here about different ways to take out different kinds of needs salt and lemon. Um, some of the dirt just needs some really good soap and scrubbing and I get bars of soap from the Mount Royal Soap Company here in Baltimore. Um, and uh, anyway, I submerge them. And even though the dress says it's dry clean only, I don't abide by that, nor do I believe in that. I think that it's perfectly fine to put a fabric into a wash, um, especially if it's a well enough made wedding dress. And um, so these are in different stages of repair and identification about what needs to happen for them. And I've set up something here where I can show you what it means to screen print. So when I'm screen printing on a prefabricated piece of clothing, it becomes a huge challenge. Uh, it's not generally the way our clothes are made. Uh, when we see something with a pattern, it's done with a bolt of fabric out at a textile mill and it's just going through these big printing presses. I don't have that, I'm not doing that because again, I am upcycling or repurposing the clothing. So I had to get very creative about how I could do that and still maintain a good um, pass with the, um, the screen. So this is a small version and this is my pattern. This is this half, this half, these are, this is the identical. And it's one game of Scrabble, right? I, I put the ink on here and I'll show you um, when we get over to the other section, but I just wanted to show you how I take the fabric and an ironing board that has been, I have a lot of cushion on the ironing board because when you're printing on fabric, you need a soft um, touch. I tape off the area that I want to print onto and I can put my print, my screen down and I would use a squeegee and go this way and then I can do the repeating pattern, okay? Um, and I realized that that's kind of hard to visualize um, without actually seeing it. But I do want you to see that it takes a lot of time for me to prepare the clothing by cleaning it. And then once it is clean, to get it set up and ready to print. Um, and it's time consuming and it's physically hard, hard work. So we'll go from that to, um, I'd like to give you some examples of some of the clothes that I've done. Um, for example, the costumes. This is the one that came from center stage. This is a vintage 1920s flapper dress and it was in horrendous condition. There were rust stains all over it. The th um, it was threadbare. So I had to learn um, to get the fabric back to a point where it could be um, handled. And it was threadbare, particularly up on the top. Uh, I'm very pleased with this dress. It's it's really looking. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Okay, and then another one from the center stage is this one. So this is a great example of where I had to tape off quite a lot because it's so easy for the um, screen, if I'm not careful, that I would end up with printing in a place where I didn't want it to be printed. So up to this point, I think it's really important to note that I have not been altering any of the clothing. I've only been using it as is. But with this new um, influx of the dresses, these 15 dresses, I am going to give myself permission to try to change some of those dresses, which I find amusing because I don't consider myself a seamstress in any shape at all. 
And then the other dress that I want to point out, this is a new one. And this is from the Wise Penny. And this, I'm, I'm really excited. <laughs> it's filthy. You can see um, I've started to, to um, treat it. There's these blue bluish spots on it that I'm letting soak in with Dawn dish detergent. That's another thing for grease marks and, and dirt. But um, this is a, if you know your fashion designers, this is a Vera Wang. Yes. Yeah. So I'm really excited. I will not change this dress other than to print on it, but um, I am looking forward to it. But it's in miserable shape. You can see these rust stains here. So this part has been treated by me with um, the lemon juice and salt to help lift that out. Now I tend to leave this in for quite a while, especially when the stain looks to be as set in and as old as it is. And by quite a while, I mean, it could be upwards of two to three weeks. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And then I just have to keep retreating it for, for a long time. So that's why that's here, the, um, the green one. So is everybody ready for a demonstration? Okay. Yeah. Hey, apron, let's move over to this side. So I'm very lucky in that with my studio, I can set it up in all these different stations so that I can um, work in series and production wise to keep things moving. Okay. So one of the other aspects to these dresses and to the vintage feel is that I was also able to get my hands on some old gloves. And I've printed on those as well. This, these, this glove in particular, I um, use with that green dress that we saw just a minute ago, right? Now to print onto a glove, I had to design my own template so that I can insert this into the glove, keep the glove flat and then be able to print on it. Okay, so. And then before I show you the actual printing, what I'd like to show you is several aspects to the way I have to document everything that I do to keep track of what we're doing. So um, there was a time when online it was called, um, there's actual Scrabble, but they've since changed it. And it, it, it the, the app that you might think Words of. Words with Friends. Yes, Words but it's not Words with Friends because Words with Friends is not an actual Scrabble board. Okay, so um, th there was one called Scrabble, and I would play that, but it's no longer in existence. It's been bought up, and um, it's just horrible. But I played that for a while, and um, you can see where I would make sure that I have all the words together, and I would find what those words were, define them, and then I would write my haiku, or senryu, which is more accurate. Okay. Then I document all of the work and I talk about like here, the, the green dress is from a neighbor I had had named Sarah Fawcett. Um, the one downstairs that you saw behind Kirk and I is the dress that I had worn um, in a, a second marriage. And um, the orange dress there from center stage. So, oh, and there's a dress, it's kind of hiding, it's peeking behind there. It's a rose colored dress and I printed in the underskirt for that. And that is from a friend of mine who was um, uh, jilted. So she was very happy to see the dress go somewhere else. And she has said that it's one of the best decisions that she's ever made. And I'm very grateful to her for, for having the dress. And jilted means left at the altar. Well, she wasn't like technically left at the altar, okay. but it was pretty damn close. Okay. So. Um, it, and it was awful. And I remember my, our heart broke for her, you know, to see everybody do, do that. Um, and so here, I'll read you one of my summary. Cozy palace queen, distant, aloof sentiments, ensconced in haute chic. One more. Yes, sir. I, sir, yes. Earnest, ardent, wide-eyed lass. If, if only once. I like writing them. 
<laughs> you can hear that snapping? That's my <laughs> fan base telling me. Yay, wonderful. Okay. So um, I did want to save this until last. When I start printing, there's two methods for screen printing, of course. You can print on paper or you can print on fabric, right? Textile. And on paper, there are so many different kinds of paper. And this is, this is where um, I got really interested in what paper can also do. And, um, and started the, when um, Kirk mentioned about the Japanese aspect to it, it's not just the senryu, it's also origami. So at times I will fold the paper that once I've printed it and I've made it into several different kinds of shapes. So here we go, folks. I'm going to do it first on this rough papers, and then I'm going to do it on a smooth piece, and then a piece of textile, so that you can see the difference. And let's hope this um, goes okay for us, because I don't have everything quite the way I would usually do it. We're going to use green ink today, right? So I've already had this mixed up. Um, when you're screen printing, you mix your color with what's called an extender base, and then we're going to do something called a flood coat. Now, some people say, I don't always do the flood coat. And I take it on faith that when I do my printing, everything's going to come out all right. Because of the size of this, um, I'm only going to do a certain section of it. But again, it's I just, it's not a great sound. I like that sound. OK, there we have print A. Beautiful on that quality of paper. Looks really lovely and shimmery. Okay, move that to there. And then we'll do um, a flat one. This is a different kind of paper. And again, make sure I've got the ink I need going across here. Print B. It looks different. It does look different. It should look different. It's two different types of paper. Now I have to move over here to the fabric really quickly. It's um, because there's so much air flowing through the studio, the screen will start to dry very quickly. And when that happens, it gets blocked up. And then it makes it very hard to print. And then you have to wash the screen. So I try to do as many. This one I'm going to do very gently. Okay, folks, this is the hardest part is to print on fabric. It's especially because I thought I had it pinned down better. And, and this is a very thin fabric, so. Now, the difference between printing on fabric and printing on paper. Paper, I can actually layer the paint. And I was a painter before I was a screen printer. And I, I approach screen printing as a painter would, not as um, a screen printer. Well, a screen printer is a painter, but it's just a different form of painting instead of with a brush. But nonetheless, on a piece of paper, it's a lot easier to um, layer the work. On textile, not as easy, much more difficult, um, it, really a challenge. And that was the one thing I had to learn to kind of give up. So that's where a lot of the dresses you'll see as monochromatic. I do want to start um, adding some other color in and every here and again I do, um, but it may only be a very subtle pass with some gold or red, like on the pink dress, there's some gray ink and some rose colored ink and that's about it okay well um should i stop back in yeah. but um hey. <laughs> well, so, while you're talking i'm going to put this ink away well i want you to walk the dog because i want you to show it the front of your house oh yeah you have a i love the front of my house and you have a sculpture i do well. so in, in the front of the house okay let's do this though and before we go i just want to once again acknowledge our sponsor Maryland State Arts Council and Riko Vodka and our first artist kicking off the 32nd annual um, open studio tour, Sanzi. <laughs> and so um, 
yeah stay with us for the rest of the weekend we yeah, have tons of artists everyone, coming up because the open studio it's like i have been doing it for decades and i just love it and it's a great way to learn about the processes behind the work that you really have come to love and buy local art support your artists Absolutely. we are here for that that's and, what both and, is all about obviously. and truthfully one of the ways that you can support me is i have a patreon i'm a patreon creator so you will get videos behind the scenes videos of this part of the process of what these 15 dresses are going to become and it, it it for as little as three bucks a month three bucks a month it, that's like not even a cup of coffee but also also baltimore and beyond because this is uh obviously broadcast through the various uh, platforms sanzi is an artist so her art is for sale i yes. think i have i think i have a couple pieces yes you do and so um um yeah look her up uh, I'm sure we can put her web information on there if it already is not there. So look her up. She's a, obviously very talented. And then she has a couple shows coming up in the future. And I'm trying to work with her for something next year. Um, for those of you who are in tune with the cloisters here in Baltimore. So I think her work obviously would be perfect there. Um, so, um, so. Let's go downstairs and look at, so the, the thing that's outside, it's called Tumbleweeds. And Tumbleweeds is going to be in the Foggy Bottom Biennial. And there is a curator named Kaylee Bryant Greenwell who saw my work. I don't know where she saw my work or how she found me. I've forgotten to ask her. But I will be in the Foggy Bottom Biennial, which is really a privilege. I mean, there have been some fantastic artists in that. It was supposed to have happened this past spring, and they bumped it to next spring. Right. And that's also important as a... Uh, both uh, that we highlight our artists so they have opportunities on the national stage and as curator that's exactly what i do so let's go out. all right let's go look oh did you oh, you saw the gloves right yes i sure was do you have any social media handles that you like to add to this slide One of the things you'll notice is my beautiful yellow house, which I just had someone paint for me about two summers ago. And, um, <laughs> I think it pretty well speaks about my personality. Anyway, this is my tumbleweed. And um, I have five of these, and they'll be placed outside. It's meant to be a sculptural piece, and it will weather with the weather. Um, and it's a screen print. This part is the screen print. And then this is all woodblock print. Um, this is actually a haiku because I, um, and actually Cecilia Wickman, um, contemporary curator at the Baltimore Museum of Art, was the one who accepted my proposal to put this into a show that was at the Sandy Spring Museum two summers ago. That's so crazy. She was going to be on the panel for tomorrow. Really? Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Cecilia is just wonderful. And she's really a, a nice up and coming curator. So. Um, there were five of these spotted throughout there, and then uh, again, they'll be at the Foggy Bottom Bellini. Well, we're outside in Baltimore getting way too close. So. <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> I do have a map. Um, so I want to again thank you for watching and thank Fuzzy for being our thank you. first really an honor. Um, artist during our first virtual open studio tours. So, um, Thank you very much, and we're off to see Zach, and we're going to do some glass blowing. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Ciao.